On the 15th of June, 1869, the Honourable Lavinia Littleton was sitting at a little velvet table in Belgrave Square in London. When Edward Talbot came, he said, to tell her that he had been chosen to be the warden of Keeble College. As she noted in her diary, it was only after, quote, talking a good bit on this, that he plucked up courage to ask, tremblingly, whether she might like to come and help him, to which she said yes, underlined firmly in her diary. The project of the new college thus decisively framed the marriage between Lavinia Littleton and Edward Talbot. She was only 20. He was 26 and well established in Oxford as an official student and tutor in history at Christchurch. But he was the third choice as warden of Keeble. The initial hope had been that Henry Lydon, the charismatic anti-liberal keeper of the Tractarian flame, would agree to take on the role. When he refused, a clergyman called Martin was briefly under consideration, though he understood his marriage to be an impediment. Edward Pusey, whose views were fundamental in the matter, had made clear that his strong preference was for a head who was called to celibacy. Edward Talbot was not even yet a priest. Most unnervingly, he felt himself to be far from first in line in wooing Lavinia. Indeed, when Edward's candidacy was being discussed, Pusey commented that he had heard something about a possible engagement, but had been given the impression it was unlikely to come off, so had thought no more about it. Having heard that it had, though, he developed the somewhat forbidding view that, quote, both T and his future wife have an idea of self-sacrifice for the good of Keeble College, and such a wife might be great good indirectly to the students. Religious women have such a powerful influence for good over young men. In fact, Lavinia Talbot's part in the enterprise, not just her energy and her connections, but her sense of purpose, her intellectual seriousness, her profound theological sympathy with high church Anglican sensibilities, together with her wit and lightness of touch, was fundamental to its taking off. But her impact was direct, not indirect. Her influence was actively powerful. In proposing to her, Edward knew that he needed her. She, in turn, regarded her role as central to a joint vocation. Her father, Lord Littleton, a prominent figure in liberal educational policy, and her uncle by marriage, William Ewart Gladstone, the Prime Minister, were both key figures in the plan to found a college in memory of John Keeble. And Lavinia carried that social and political capital with her to Oxford and to her marriage. On her very first visit to Oxford on 5th of July 1869, she confidently defined her goal to identify who's who and what's what. She was very good at it. We know a lot about Lavinia because she kept a diary. In the Keeble context, it's tended to be used as a window on the development of the college, rather than read for the part it played in her own self-fashioning, and hence her construction of her role in Keeble in the process. Her sense of herself as a diarist was fundamentally self-assured. She was to be a protagonist and commentator, not merely a witness. She noted at the beginning of her first volume, 1st of January 1862, when she was aged 13 all but four days, that the book was a gift from her old journal-keeping sister. The keeping of a daily journal was an important discipline, providing scope for reflection, the honing of judgment, and practice in articulating it. It complemented and underpinned family conversation and debate. Although the basic shape and style of the diary were set early on, some new elements were introduced along the way, which served to elaborate on the development of her network of connections and her sense of her own mental world. In volume 11, which started in May 1876, 
she proclaimed her intention to record her correspondence and her reading matter. Rather than books read with or for Edward, which she had itemised from the start, those cited were the ones which she read for herself. Medieval and American history, Dante and Daniel Deronda. She adored George Eliot. When Romola had come out, she had been so immersed in it that she failed to write her diary for several days. In the headings of the diary volumes, her practice of ultra-precision about her, old age, her own age, a mode which we associate with children, but which she continued into adulthood, seems to have been intended to position herself very specifically in history. In turn, she juxtaposed her discussion of her own daily life with her very clear views on national and world politics, education policy, the situation in Ireland, the Franco-Prussian War. She was very engaged in the debates on reform of endowed secondary schools, to which her father made a major contribution, and was critical of the compromises incorporated into the 1870 Bill to introduce compulsory elementary education. She wrote succinctly and trenchantly about the necessity for home rule in the wake of the government defeat on Ireland in March 1873. The public, the political and the personal mapped directly onto each other and both formed and informed the independence of her voice. Politics were the family business but needed to be kept directed at the higher good and prevented from becoming solipsistic. Her critical insight spans the generations. When Parliament was dissolved in early 1874, she observed shrewdly and confidently that, quote, Uncle has issued a manifesto in the shape of an address to his constituents, very cleverly vague, but full of promises of a rather too large character. I do rather grudge a whole month being taken out of the ordinary session for electioneering at this end of the year. Oh dear, how I hate my relations when they begin to talk politics, as seen through the haze of an election. The night before the undergraduates arrived on the first day of the new college, she recorded that Paris was surrounded and Orléans had fallen. The frame within which she developed her perspective on Oxford and on the distinctiveness of Keeble was already wide and her focus sharp. The practical and the intellectual were intertwined. Lavinia and Edward's engagement was punctuated by regular visits to the college building as it took shape. Although Lavinia didn't like the architecture, on her first visit she found it, quote, immensely larger and on a more dignified scale than she had expected. She seems to have egged on her prospective mother-in-law to confront Butterfield about details of the plans. The two women breakfasted, lunched and dined picking up, quote, useful Keeble College gossip. And they, quote, tore over the town, shopping for turkey carpets, sofas, chairs, grates, etc. The women power breakfasted. Edward was drawn into some of the shopping trips. Meanwhile, Lavinia was busy helping Edward read up for his ordination. He devolved to her the analysis of the 16th century Anglican theorist of church and state, Richard Hooker, they read together the contemporary liberal theologian Westcott. Lavinia was very sad when that was finished. And she started to learn to read Greek. She further, quote, spent some hours trying to help Edward over some office drudgery as to letter writing. At the same time, she noted beating him at croquet. Her family was famously sporty. They could field a whole cricket team among them, amongst themselves and there is a tantalising reference to the younger Lavinia playing football. After evening service on the 12th of June, the day of Edward's ordination, in a group which included the principal of Cudston Theological College, Lavinia noted what she described as a funny, lively talk over the question of women being better or not than men. One can well imagine why such a discussion might have been initiated. The role of wife of a head of house, let alone of a new college, 
was completely undefined, as was the position of intelligent, educated women in Oxford in general. Fellows of colleges were only just starting to be permitted to marry, and collegiate life in Oxford remained predominantly homosocial. In some respects, the fact that Keeble was new and self-consciously trying to be different offered real opportunities in such a world. There was scope to shape the role. At the same time, the fact that the college was being run by a very small group of young men made for an intimacy in which Lavinia could share. She was a talented singer, and remarkably she was invited to collaborate with one of the tutors, Louis George Milne, in discussions about the choir and its training. She clearly had an affectionate P.G. Woodhouse-ish rapport with Milne, recording that one evening he had come in after chapel very hungry and she had to rout him out the tail end of a cold pheasant. She lost a real friend when he was appointed Bishop of Bombay in 1876. Her involvement in programming and rehearsing music for the chapel ran alongside a streak of light entertainment. She joined the glee club set up by the undergraduates and formed the Keeble Quartet, which gave concerts in Oxfordshire villages. In North Morton, where Milne had served his curacy, she sang a solo, I Love My Love in the Morn, which was, quote, wildly encored, a success repeated at the first Keeble concert held in the college in late 1871. In the run-up to the opening of the college, and indeed through all the complicated debates about its status in the university, Lavinia was clearly fully involved in all discussions and sought out meetings with key people. On her trips to Oxford with Edward's mother, her breakfasting was with influential churchmen and theologians of different generations, William Palmer, Fremantle, Lydon and Scott Holland. Questions about the particular pitch of the college were very live. In addition to their avowed appeal to religiously observant Anglican young men of limited means, there were references to the scope for attracting young men from the colonies. There was hope for candidates from Australia, which tell the story both of social disadvantage in, rela in relation to older foundations, but also of wide ambition and a strong sense of mission beyond as well as within Britain. A wretched man came all the way from Canada to be assessed from, for entry in 1873, but failed. It is telling that amongst the Talbot's first visitors were the Bards, who had just founded an Episcopal college in New York, which combined pre-seminary preparation with a broader liberal education, and saw itself as analogous to Keeble. The challenges of attracting intellectually and religiously serious young men who could be influential in the world were real ones, especially at a time when school and social background counted for more than academic excellence. Lavinia went to hear Edward examining undergraduates viva voce in the schools and was shocked by how astonishingly ignorant and stupid the men were. There was a particular pioneering spirit given that the college opened when large parts of the infrastructure were unfinished and the first cohorts were small. During several of the first few years, there was an awareness of the risk that more students might be accepted than there were rooms for. Whilst in 1873, Lavinia commented calmly that the five men without rooms would, quote, probably easily dispose of themselves, in 1874, those in the same situation were put off until January. The emotional pressure was high, as the selection was only a day or two before the start of term. There were tears, piteous pleading, and even a fainting. And by 1874, it was noted that not only groups of anxious young men, but, quote, old fathers were hanging about, waiting for the verdict. Whilst Lavinia maintained an ironic perspective on certain aspects of college life, quote, endless little college meetings, the minutest detail discussed threadbare, she took very seriously the task of giving the undergraduates a broad education through the cultivation of conversation. Regularly, small groups were invited to Lavinia and Edward's rooms after dinner. It was hard work. 
The veneer appreciated it when they were not too shy or gauche, but inevitably they tended that way. Quote, Messrs Duncan and Scott came in. Very pleasant if they had only gone away at nine instead of ten. She was simultaneously receiving streams of visitors from the academic hierarchy, who were often equally awkward. Lavinia had a real gift for capturing, in a few words, the nuances of boringness. A visiting member of the College Council was described as, quote, very pleasant and simple, not exactly interesting, though, and taking the same amount of interest in everything. And there was much paying of formal calls and an incessant round of dining out, which involved equivalent and all too familiar traps. At a dinner at Jowett's, Lavinia noted sitting next to, quote, an odious Mr Wright, who laid down a series of sharp, paradoxical questions, as, for instance, that no one cared for or ought to care for poetry after 21. January 1871 brought a, quote, deathly party at the Rector of Lincoln's. And after another dull dinner in February, she exclaimed, how hard it is sometimes to remember people one has met. This set of social expectations had to be endured in order to put the college securely on the Oxford map. But Lavinia clearly sought out particular people with whom she had lively and stimulating discussions. And when Edward was caught up with the tutors club or was invited to dinner in other colleges, she, in her words, quote, pranced off on her own to musical evenings, or to listen to a debate at the Union, which she found a feeble and childish discussion, no good speech, many bad jokes. Much better was driving back from Cudston with Dr Bright in a hansom cab, quote, talking theology violently. She went regularly to the School of Art and attended lectures, for example, Henry Maines on Indian law, one of only two women to do so. With a few other like-minded women, Lavinia oversaw the setting up of a committee to arrange lectures for ladies. Such committees already existed in other towns, but the goal was to establish something more systematic and intellectually coherent in Oxford, aimed at a wide demographic, including tradesmen's girls. They decided to start at the beginning of English history, and to follow each historical course with one on the literature of the period. Essays were written, and there was an examination at the end. And to set a good example, most members of the committee went in for it without giving their name. Lavinia Talbot came second. This group became the Ladies' Association, which went on to organise lectures for the new women's colleges. Such educational projects, rooted in the revived high church incarnational theology with which the college was to become associated, were linked to more standard philanthropic work for the poor and back to the college as a community within which qualities of leadership and social responsibility were to be cultivated and practised. The form which this incarnational impulse was to take and which was exemplified in the collection of essays called Lux Mundi, edited by Charles Gore and published in 1889, was much more liberal than men like Lydon could tolerate. Talbot, as the first warden of Keeble, was criticised, just as was Gore, the first head of Pusey House, for betraying Tractarian principles. Despite being an ironic figure, Talbot had diverged from his patrons early on, over the rather arcane question of the place of the 39 articles in the past degree. On this question, as on others, Lavinia was totally clear about the logic and about the need to strike out independently and on as broad a basis as possible. Having been brought up in a large landed gentry family, helping her elder sisters to fulfil the roles of, her, of their mother, who had died young, and spending time with a father dedicated to intellectual rigour and exchange provided an excellent preparation for running a college. She was not intimidated by being one woman in a sea of men. 
She wrote in 1875 with a nice sense of irony to Henry Scott Holland about her baby daughter, who, she said, had, quote, a due sense of the decorum of behaving nicely among her 125 male colleagues. Her relationship with Edward was close and supportive. They were intellectual companions and clearly enjoyed reading and debating together. Yet there was a quickness and liveliness in her, which he mostly appreciated, but could not emulate. He was more ponderous in his judgments. He took the lead in reading aloud to her, spouting, as she put it. The relentlessness of his pedagogical impulse is only revealed in little hints. On their honeymoon, travelling from France to Switzerland, after a bout of John Henry Newman on the necessity of righteousness for existence in heaven, he began teaching her the names of the mountains. Quote, very patiently, I must say, she dryly commented. On a July day, a few, year, few years later, Edward was reading aloud in St John's Gardens. Lavinia recorded, quote, I went to sleep there and woke to feel myself refreshed and the air quite cool. The hours had evidently passed. History does not relate whether he was still reading. The volume of Lavinia's journal, which covers the two years from February 1869 to February 1871, was regarded by her as particularly special, marking her engagement, her marriage, the birth of Keeble College, and the dramas of the Franco-Prussian War. She wrote a summary at the end, following a note that she and Edward had had their first evening together alone since the start of term. Quote, I could not write of anything more, and there is only room to say how sorry I am to leave this journal. The journal took on life as her companion and interlocutor through what she recognised was the most important transition of her life. She knew who was who and what was what. Thanks very much. <laughs>